The, the purpose of your life is not going to be happiness. Sometimes it is. Sometimes that will come. But there will be difficult periods in your life, and happiness won't suffice then. But what you can have in your life is an adventure. And the truth is the best adventure. There's no doubt about that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, you don't know what's going to happen if you say what you think. Now, I don't mean incautiously, and I don't mean provocatively or any more than necessary. You don't know what's going to happen. So that's very adventurous. But also, if it's you and your voice, then it's your adventure. And if it isn't, like if you're crafting your speech or manipulating in any way, or parroting or abiding by the dictates of the crowd, then I don't know whose adventure you're having, but it's not yours. We're not having a fight about who has the right to speak freely. We're having a fight about whether or not your claim that free speech exists is nothing but a masquerade for your willingness to dominate and use power. And the only reason they ever derived that to begin with is so they could exercise their power. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as free speech. That's just a lie to mask a power claim. And that's a way worse cynical criticism of the notion of free speech than you can't speak because I don't agree with I mean The pe people who need assertiveness training are all often people who are too agreeable compassionate, polite, by temperament. Now, the problem with that is that they let every other, they let people walk all over them because they don't, they don't stand up enough for themselves. And the consequence of that is they get resentful and then they get bitter and then they get conniving and then they get, and then they'll mob. They push themselves beyond their limits and they, and then they won't even recognize the limits because they feel, well, if I'm not doing everything for you, then then I'm not a good person. It's like, no, a good person does a little for you. Like if I'm acting properly with you, say in this conversation, there's something in it for you mm. and there's something in it for me, right? right? And we want that to be reciprocal. Mm. And so the cost of me bending too far in your direction is that I'll become bitter and resentful and conniving. And, and that and resentment is an unbelievably toxic state of being. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you wanna be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. Life is brutally difficult and, and sometimes unbearably brutally difficult. Say, well, you're miserable, you have your reasons. And they might be deep reasons. But if you let the misery demoralize you and make you bitter and cynical and cowardly and make you withdraw, then first of all, that's a failure in the highest sense on your part and all it's gonna do is make everything worse. Terrible as things are, there's a lot more to you than you can possibly imagine and that if you face those things forthrightly and with some faith and courage, then you can, you can you can have the adventure of your life and prevail even over catastrophe. I think it's a corollary of an information overload theory. One of the advantages to, to having the computational power we have is that everything is at your fingertips. And the disadvantage is that everything's in your face. And by everything, it might be 40 million pornographic images. Like that's a lot. Or an endless array of tragic scenarios. And really endless. And so that's a problem. And the problem, the fundamental problem, is how do you handle the fire hose of information? And no one really knows the answer to that. It's no wonder that young people are demoralized and anxious because we're doing everything we can to demoralize them and make them anxious. On the masculine front, we, we tell young boys that, well, the world's a terrible patriarchal tyranny and all of that patriarchal tyranny, which is the whole explanation for history, has done nothing but oppress and exploit people and destroy the planet. And so that any manifestation 
of that masculine impulse on your part is equivalent to the world destroying force. Well, I think, first of all, that annoys narcissistic women, no end. Also, it, it frightens a large number of women because many women have never had a good relationship with anyone masculine in their life. I have some sympathy for that because there are no shortage of women out there who've never had a positive relationship with anyone masculine. They're completely unable to discriminate between narcissistic power and compulsion and confident competence. Mm -hmm. I will say this and everybody's gonna hate me, but as a woman, just because you go change your parts doesn't make you a woman. Right. Sorry. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. Like, if you want me to call you a her, I will, because that's what you want. But that doesn't make you a woman just because I call you a her and just because you got a surgery. We've accepted this preposterous hypothesis that your identity is only subjectively defined. The only people who think their identity is subjectively defined are two-year-olds. And I mean that technically, because two-year-olds are egocentric, which means they can't bring their identity in alignment with a, a social norm. A sophisticated identity is not only socially negotiated, as the constructivists know perfectly well, but it's also it's got a dynamism about it because it has to be constantly renegotiated. Queen Elizabeth stood for or embodied a whole set of virtues, which is the right way of thinking about it, that aren't in the least bit fashionable, but in fact, they're the inverse of fashionable in some sense, but are desperately needed. Humility, dutifulness, careful emotional self-regulation, discretion, uh, the antithesis of narcissism, uh, all of that, and she managed it extraordinarily well for 70 years. And 